Well, good morning, Dan Russell. Good morning. Good to see you again. Yes. So today I'm very excited because we're going to update some of our previous conversations about search and probably about Google more specifically. Um, for those of you who haven't met Dan before, Dan calls himself a, a search anthropologist and a free range search scientist. That's right. I know that Dan has worked everywhere. He's worked for Xerox. He's worked for IBM. He's worked for Apple and at very high level labs. I know him personally from his work with Google. Um, and Dan, I think it'd be better if you kind of kind of nutshelled who you are. Nutshell is a verb. That's excellent. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're right. I'm, I'm a sort of a free range scientist at this point. Uh, I specialize in search, but more generally, how do people find and organize and use information that they find online? I guess, truthfully, I should say information anywhere in the world, because in particular, the boundary between the online world and the offline world is becoming increasingly porous, right? Mm -hmm. So we've talked before in earlier conversations about the importance in control F, because it turns out huge numbers of people don't know about control F, command F, or find on page. It seems like an obvious thing. A lot of people don't know it. But this porous boundary is shifting because I've seen people in the wild taking a photograph of something and then using the command F's function on the image, right? Which is really interesting. Does it work? Uh, yeah, you can actually, it actually can do that. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I will leave that as an exercise for the reader how to do that. But it involves, right. for example, OCRing the text, right? Right. And so now with with Lens, you can actually say select text in image, select, copy, paste it, boom, search, you're done. All right. So, so for those of, for those of us, who, those of the folks who don't know what Control F is, they may not know optical character recognition. Oh, oh. <laughs> Let me back up. <laughs> All right. So we, we got to get back to what we originally decided right. we were going to talk about today. So um, I, it, it's no secret that everybody is talking about generative AI. Um, people are kind of caught up very heavily uh, in chat GPT, whatever version um, they're using. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And I am using a bunch of different search tools, um, including BARD. And I've been looking at the Bing Chat AI and um, perplexity, perplexity and, and illicit and consensus and all of these. Um, but yep. I have been very excited about the new things that I've been seeing in BARD um, and playing a lot. And I know you have from reading your research research blog um, can you tell me or us about what you're excited yeah, about, yeah. what's changing, what should we watch? Uh, sure. Uh, or wherever you want to start. <laughs> the short answer is everything. Okay. <laughs> this reminds me a little bit about the classic Woody Allen line when someone said, what books have you been reading? He said, oh, I've been reading War and Peace. They asked, what's it about? He says, Russia. That's true, but not helpful. <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a summary, and and so so in some sense it's it's like summarizing War and Peace, um, summarizing the state of the art. So in, where do we in, start? Let, let's just let's start with where where you started. Um, okay. First off, are, are these so? Let's discriminate between gener different kinds of generative AI. There's all the image stuff, right? Then we're going to ignore that mostly for the moment. Um, there's all the image stuff like Mid Journey and you know Dall E and all that stuff. There's a million of them, right? And yeah. Adobe's got their versions of all that. So Firefly, whatever. Yeah, exactly. So then there's all the large language model stuff. Mm -hmm. So there's Bard, Perplexity, Claude, you know, ChatGPT 3.5 and four, and who knows? Maybe there's 4.5, and maybe there'll be five someday, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so are these search engines? Or I are they don't questions? know. Right? So um, I don't know either, but let me tell you how large language models work. <laughs> in, in one sentence, maybe two sentences, uh, they basically crawl all this text data that's out there. And we'll ignore the image stuff for a minute. They crawl all this text data out there. And then they basically make a 
deep computational model of how words connect together. And so when you ask a question, what it's doing is it's stitching together strings of text and pieces of text in ways that are informed by that model. Okay, so notice a couple of that. I've not mentioned truth. I haven't mentioned credibility. I haven't mentioned all these other kinds of descriptors of, of sources and search engines that you might want. So one of the things that happens is that it will, these large language models, and I just for the moment talk about BARD and ChatGPT and all of the versions. Right? Um, they basically are constructing an answer or they are, let me put it this way. They are constructing a block of text that is in response to your prompt. So prompt is not the same as a query exactly. Um, so uh, maybe I should just show you something. Let me share my screen with you if that's all I sure. find it. Okay, so at this point you should, do you see my screen? I you do. don't yet. Where I do. Mm -hmm. You do. I need a simplified summary of this article. So here's a, um, an example where this is actually, if you look in here, this is a, actually a fairly long article. So this is a, a article about predatory organisms called mixotropes. And I, the prompt is, I need to simplify, I'll, let me highlight it here. I need to simplify some of this article to give this to ninth grade level. And then the rest of that is the stuff, the, um, everything after that is the text of the article. Okay, so then Bard in this case replies, and that's sort of fine. It gives an okay, okay, okay summary of that article. Now the article is probably, I don't know, 600 words or something. And so what it's doing is, you know, the query, the quote query here is, can you give this summary to me at the ninth grade level? That's not, a, you know, so we've shifted in, from the way we thought about search engines in the past. So now we're asking them to do much more sophisticated things like summarize, like, you know, tell me whatever. Let me upfront say the thing I'm mostly worried about is that people will look at stuff like this and just accept it as truth. And the phenomenon is that people read what looks like coherent prose about a topic and say, excellent, done, right? And so what you see people doing is they will go to BART and ask questions that they used to ask Google, like, you know, what is an organelle? Something like that. And mostly, mostly, when confronted with simple, inf what we call short information queries like that, Bard will do a good a good job. It will tell you what an organelle is, and that's fine. That's, that's fine. And then when you start getting more complicated questions, then it gets more dicey. So you've probably heard about hallucinations before. Here's um, here's the blog post. So I, I write this blog called Search Research. <laughs> um, but one of these things is that, you know, uh, beliefs change over time. And so if, for example, you look for this particular paper, right, uh, by Nisbet and Timothy Wilson right here. Uh, so it's this is a sort of summary of it, and that's fine. But what I can do is, as a, as a sense-making question, is how do you know whether or not the, the, that result from 1977, or 19, uh, when was it? That's John Bart. Uh, this is uh, 77, yeah. Is, is it still true? Because this is, you know, this is 50 years later. So how do we track the evolution of scientific thought over time? And so um, I, uh, I'm looking for the other, the, let me find the, go back to that and I'll find the newer, newer post. There we go. So this is my answer to that. And so in answering the questions, I actually asked for comments from an LLM. And here's the prompt I used, right? So here's the prompt, which you can think of as a query, but I said in telling in this paper, demonstrate the ability, blah, blah, blah. Has, how well has this idea lasted over past 40 years? Is it widely believed now? And so um, what's interesting is that the response here, this is Bard's reply to that, that question, to that prompt. It's, it's okay. Um, it didn't tell me a lot that was kind of not known, um, but, but you have to be really careful about these things because as you know, sometimes it will just hallucinate things. Uh, or it will do something just totally bogus like this. I asked Bard, are there any Africa countries in Africa whose name begins with letter K? There are four countries in Africa. This is the response, right? Kenya, good job. Kazakhstan, last time I checked, Kazakhstan was not in Africa, 
right? Kyrgyzstan, Kuwait, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> so you see part of the problem here? I mean, this isn't even hallucinating. This is just making stuff up. Yes, those are countries. And yes, they begin with K, but they're not in Africa. Here, here's the deep point I want to make. These systems don't actually have a deep understanding of what they're saying. In fact, I would argue they don't have any understanding of what they're saying. Here's here's a good one, right? Uh, I asked, so in when you're in New York, do you say, uh, I'll meet you at 53rd and 7th. Is the 53rd the street or the avenue, right? It's just a standard question. If you're not from New York, if you're from New York, it's obvious. If you're not from New York, it's like, I have no idea, right? So I'm a California child. I have no idea. When somebody says 53rd and 7th, I might be in the wrong end of the city, right? So I asked a couple of New Yorker humans, right, which is, you know, which is first. And they gave, they said the right thing, right? right. Um, but when you ask Bard, it says here, canonical artists to list the street name first given by the avenue name. Okay, mm, fine. If you ask Bing, it says, according to TripAdvisor, you should do it this way, right? So here's the thing that's interesting about this. Um, uh, Bart says, Bard says streets first and then gives a reason that makes no sense. It's totally spurious. It's a, that's a kind of hallucination, right? Or in another example, I've seen where it just says something. It's kind of like a slightly schizophrenic person talking to you because they're just rambling on and on about stuff. The rambling on and on is given by the probabilities of the model. It has nothing to do with reality, right? So what this means, what this means is that if you ask Bard or ChatGPT a question, it's not appealing to some deep database. It doesn't have a knowledge graph underneath it. It doesn't actually have a representation of reality. It's just pulling out sequences of words that are plausible in sequence in the data, right? So what this means is that's why hallucinations happen, right? You can ask, uh, I've got a, a bunch of examples here, but here's, here's my blog post about large language models, truth and consistency. Um, so for example, here's, here's uh, the conversation I had with ChatGPT4. Uh, what are those I'm like next most likely five words to follow the phrase let me not to the marriage of true minds now you know the rest of that right and it says that the next five words are admit impediments like wait a second you're three words short come on dude <laughs> right if you ask bard if you ask bard here's the reply and it kind of gets it right okay fine you could say well chat gpt doesn't know how to count but you see the deeper problem is that it doesn't know anything. And so when it gets the number of words correct, it's kind of getting lucky in that it was trained on something that said the next five words are. So let me show you another example. So um, I was interested in what was the, this is my query. What was the first short animated film, right? We've all seen them. So if I ask Bard, what was the first animated short? It says the first animated short film was Phantasmagoria. Right, 1908. Remember that date, right? So I went to regular Google and said the same thing. And it says here, 1907, Cole, okay. Uh, hmm. He then did 1908, Fantasmic Okay, so now we've got 1908, 1907. Okay. If you read the Wikipedia page on that topic from which Google derived that answer, you'll find that actually he produced a, a film called Humorous Faces in 1906. Here's the point. When I went back to Bard and I said, hey, Bard, wasn't the first animated short 1906? It says, yes, you are correct. Like, wait a second. <laughs> you just told me it was 1908 and now you're saying it's 1906, fine. Now, this you'll see this behavior a lot with large language models. Ask a question, get an answer. And then you say, well, I thought the answer was something else. It will agree with you. It will totally agree with you. Say, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and, and you can actually make it go back and forth. So it has no grasp on reality or truth in any any meaningful sense. If you take most the, the earliest animated short was in 1906, we'll say, sure, absolutely. Fine. I mean, you see where this is going, right? Yeah. So, yeah. 
so it's it's very very tricky to get this as a reliable source so the the heuristic i always tell people in my classes is it's great for certain uses but check everything and one of the things you might have had students say to me, well, why would I use it in the first place? And the answer is there's sometimes some really interesting information that you can get from the language models. It can give you search terms you might not have thought about, exactly. concepts concepts you might not have thought about. It may give you sources. So basically, it's you think of it as a very smart friend you can talk to about these things. And it will say, hey, here's a few things you might not have thought about. Then you can use that to go forward and do your regular regular validation checking. These facts were wrong, but when you were asking it to um, summarize the article, yeah. you can choose from among several drafts. Yes, on that that's, right. that's this feature over here, view other drafts. In what way is it doing it differently each time? And what's telling it to do it this paragraph that way or summarize this? and? I had it. What's the sausage making process here? <laughs> um, uh, I can tell you. Is it too um, deep I, for me? I think it might be. No, no, no. I, well, let, let, let me give it a shot. Um, um, basically, when the language model runs, there are probably millions of different versions of what it could say. If you tweak the, the parameters, the, the, the behavior parameters just a little bit, and so behind the curtain, what's actually happening is it's generating, think of it as generating a forest of, of uh, sentence completions going forward. And it chose what seems like the best one, the best route through that forest, which is the, the, the what you're seeing here, this is text. It could easily say, let's tweak that parameter by just a little bit, click, regenerate it. And that's how it generates another draft. So when I click on this button, right here, there are different drafts here. Now they all start the same, um, but they will be slightly different because it made different choices along the generation path. So by analysis, by analogy, when you and I are talking and you, you start a string to, with, you're saying, oh, Dan, I think that now you've got a lot of choices here, right? And what Bard does is says, well, the most plausible one here is that one out of this list of 100. But the second time through, you'd probably choose a different one, right? For example, one of the heuristics that people have in speech or in writing is to not repetitively use the same word over and over and over again. Right? So if I'm talking about, um, you know, say organelles in this example, I may use organelle the first time, I might say plastid the second time, or I might say, you know, whatever. Uh, I would, might use synonyms. And so this is part of what makes a good writer a good writer is you have a, a large repertoire of these things. So what Bard is doing is it has a large repertoire of different plausible answers. And it's just choosing one. When you say, give me draft three, it gives you a slightly less good one. But it's, hmm. it, it, it literally has a million of them to choose from. So, So that's what's happening. Okay, so now this is working on a piece of text that you imported. That's right. That's okay. right. Here's here's a different one. Um, so here's a question I posed to it, which was, uh, "What's the role of nuclear subset?" Sorry, I know this is very wonky, but <laughs> go read the blog post. Um, but this is the kind of sophisticated. I'm showing you a sophisticated use, someone that you know at the university might might use. Yeah. Um, so nuclear subset are these tiny organelles. This this particular. Uh, single cell organism steals it. Uh, so it's interesting, right? It actually breaks, you know, think of a little single cell organism eating another single cell organism, but it doesn't just eat it. What's so interesting about this is it actually steals stuff out of it. Ooh. So there are, it, it calls into question what's a plant and what's an animal. Mm -hmm. So one of the big ways this works is uh, mesodinium, this, this particular unicellular thing, will attack another plant unicellular organism and selectively steal the chloroplasts, which is the thing that makes photosynthesis work. And it doesn't eat them. It brings them into its body and then uses them to do photosynthesis for it. So the deep scientific question is, 
is mesodinium a plant or an animal? Uh, it's got chloroplasts, but it didn't make them. It stole them. So anyway, the point is, that, that this is actually what I'm using this as, as a researcher. Yeah. I'm learning all about these things. So for example, uh, uh, this is an interesting idea. Mes the, the nucleosomes can be turned on and off by chemical tags, right? Now, now if you read that as a, as a researcher, microbiologists go, wait a second. How is that possible? Because it stole this nucleosome and the DNA sequence from this other organism. How does it know how to talk to it? How does it know how to connect it? And it turns out the deep interesting result here is that all organisms use the same DNA sequences. Like, oh my gosh, right? This is an interesting, interesting result. So my point, my point about search here is that this is a great idea, but this is not useful enough. Now I have to go search for how nucleosomes can be modified by chemical tags. So it gives me an entree. And I think this is yeah. one of the great things about all of this. Yeah, it's, so, it's giving you the dots to connect too. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, so what? So the thing that I was asking about the sausage is yes. where is it getting the stuff from? Uh, um, I'm, I'm looking around for something here. Is quick. that secret um, sauce? No, no, no. Um, the secret. Is it's it is it critical. using Google's um, spiders or web crawlers? The web crawlers? No. Um, uh, yes and no. Um, uh, so Google has. Well, let me back up and tell you how large language models work. They work by, like I said, crawling or doing this analysis of large amounts of text, exabytes of text, right? So right. beyond petabytes, but you know, serious amounts of text, and that's sort of. Uh, so I've been doing AI for uh, 40 years. And the surprising thing to me about it was that when you bump up the amount of text that's being processed, the quality gets the quality of the output gets a lot better. And so this is very interesting thing. It's kind of okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And all of a sudden it gets significantly better. And so the response curve goes way up. Fabulous. Uh, frankly, I didn't expect that. But you know, that's why we do science. Um, so that's what it's being trained on. The question is, where do you get that text from? Now, Google just happens to have a copy of every single page of the web, right? So we have a lot of text just lying around. Um, is it, it going it, into it, Google Books as well? That's an interesting question. I would presume so, but I don't actually know that. Um, the There's a, a great asset of, of that, which is there's a bunch of text in there. The downside of it is you will, the system will learn archaic constructions. Ah, so for example, ah. this oh thing my, you're talking about, yeah, so uh, if they use Google Books, they use only things after like 1960. There's no point in, in scanning the couple of million books before 1960 because A, all of that sort of knowledge, a lot of that knowledge is sort of out of date now. So we'll get back to talking about out of date in a minute. But like all this stuff I just showed you about mixotropes, zero. There's nothing there about that, so it's not useful. Um, so but yeah, the same person who who decided to search the words in a sonnet. Uh, yeah, but a lot of folks have. I mean, a lot of reproductions of Shakespeare's sonnets have been up since 1960. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, things that stand the test of time, like that. Absolutely. I mean, the Declaration of Independence is in there. Okay, so what I want to do after we finish this is go back to, I think, what the question my students are going to ask later. Uh -huh. So is there value in starting in Google Books? Is there value in starting mm. in all the other Google searches that we can search independently? There, and that, that's a question I'd like to, you to answer at the end. Well, Google News and Google Trends and Google Images and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, all, all this stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, the short, I'll, I'll give you the short answer now that we're going to expand on it later. The short answer, yes. You still need to know all this stuff. <laughs> you don't, you don't get a free ride because, you know, because BART or ChatGPT knows this stuff. Um, uh, partly because of the hallucination problem, but also partly because um, oh, there's still, for example, data sets and there's images and stuff that these systems have not crawled. And in particular, 
uh, libraries are great repositories of stuff that may or may not be in the training set. So you don't know. So, and, and the problem really is, as from a librarian perspective, is that there's no catalog for what got put into the training set. I can't just go check. Um, okay, but my origin... understanding was just, yeah. I want to clarify this because I know my students are going to be worried about it. So what we've looked at is charts that, um, you know, says kind of where we know, or we, we think we know um, where the the uh, large learn language models right. are getting stuff. Yep. Uh, and among, on those charts, it says that while the chat GPT is being is, is getting its content from the the uh, the corpus of stuff that it's been trained on, it also says that Bing and Bard and some of the others are actually able to search the web and bring new stuff back. Uh, yes, and, and so there's an interesting question. Um, so let's split apart the, the points. Um, so Bard is when you build a large language model, you build a base model which is trained on, you know, uh, say an exabyte of data, the data you have. So you build that base model and then you add a layer on top of it, which is called pre-training, which is more current stuff. So the stuff from today, this week, whatever. So relatively up to date. Um, and that will work for a while, but then every so often you have to just bite the bullet and say, let's retrain the whole model, right? So, and so then you get this incremental update. Um, the thing that nobody has figured out how to do quite yet is how to, take the basic model and say, take today's news and work it into the base model. Right now it goes into this over layer, this pre-training layer. It, and that kind of works, but it's not in some sense deeply integrated. So it doesn't influence, for example, the deep patterns inside the, the, the base model. You know, maybe someone will figure that out next week. I don't know. Well, I mean, um, one, of the, so, one of the things I read was that I don't remember which of the, which of the three larger um, large language models actually went into collaboration with AP News. Uh, I don't remember which one either. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if they all are. Because I but, imagine there's going to be a lot of mor morphing and merging as things move forward. Yeah. You know, I mean, the other thing that's happening is that um, there's all the issue about copyright. And so some some uh, authors are saying things like, well, you trained on my 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 text and it wasn't available for training. Yeah. So, Eek. Is it, yeah, it, we hear you, about that in art as well. Yeah, exactly. Same thing, uh, same sort of issues. And I, I'm of two minds about this. One of one mind says, um, I understand the concern and I get it. Um, on the other mind, however, says um, it, it's okay for me to read it, a human read it, and update my mental model <laughs> of what the authors say. And you know very well I could write in Hemingway's style, but but that's because I have basically done my own neural wetware model of his writing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in some sense, that's what it's doing. So it's not like you could say to, to Bard, "Please give me you know all the text of Tale of Two Cities," or you know, let's choose a more more recent novel, right? Like you know, Barbara Kingsolver's most recent novel, right? It, it won't work. It won't do that. Um, because it's not represented that way. So if you look inside the model, there is no copyrightable material, right? It's all probabilities. It's that the probability of this word will follow that word and so on and so on. Okay. Um, so there's no, <laughs> in some sense, is it fair use? The lawyers will determine this. And uh, what I find it going to find very interesting, we, we will see going forward, is how do you invalidate a model like that, if, say somebody says, uh, you know, one of the famous authors in this suit says, you know, you can't use any of my stuff. There's no way right now to yank it out of the model. All you can do is take the training set, yank it, take the text out of the training set and rebuild the model, which is expensive, right? It's really, like, really expensive. But if there's no tr no recourse, then they'll have to do that. I think, though, for us as as users of the system, what this means is that the behavior of the systems will shift over time. And so there's a set there are a few things that are going on here. One of which is we have I'm going to stop sharing my screen here for a second. 
um, uh, there, we have a couple of things going on. One of which is um, we have what's called model drift, where as the model is updated with say this additional daily feed or weekly feed or whatever, what it did what it did last week may not be the same thing it does this week. That's always been true in Google, but mm -hmm. because it's fairly stable, you don't really notice it much. I mean, in the edges or rapidly updating news, you will notice it. So, but that's model drift and model drift in the large language models, especially for, for Bard uh, and Bing chat GPT, they drift significantly. Okay. So I, <laughs> it, it makes it recently about we, we've been talking about the yeah. major shifts that have been happening in BARD that are pretty exciting. The integration of Lens in some yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, yeah, let's let's hang on. I'm going to get, okay. I have an example of that in just a second. It, so one of the really interesting things that's happening. <laughs> oh, Notebook LM. There you go. Uh, do you know about that? No. Have you talked about this at all? Okay. No, not yet. Um, let, me, let me share my screen again with you. And... There we go. So there's a there's a new system. It's been around in development for a while. It's now called Notebook LM, and you can sign up. I think at the bottom here. Uh, yeah, here's the wait, wait wait list right there. You see it? That blue link. Okay. Allows you to sign up if you want, and you get on. So what it is, is basically a. Think of it as Google Docs, with Bard built in. Okay. And in particular, here's a nice example of it. Um, there we go. So this is the document you're writing, this white text here. Okay. So as I'm writing, just imagine that's my Google Docs thing. Got okay. It. And over here, and these are just different documents, but let's focus on CS106 class notes. Over here is the barred perspective on your document. Interesting. Okay. So as you type, it's extracting these key topics. All right. And in particular, it does things like questions to try. So this is extracted from your own text, not extracted, but it's a summary of the questions that might come from somebody reading your text. So in essence, what a notebook LM is doing is giving a, a, an exterior agent's perspective on what you're writing. And so what you yeah, it seems to know that you're writing a lesson or or something instructional. Well, these, these are just notes. This happens to be notes. Okay. Oh yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, that's intuitive in some way. No? Uh, uh it's reading it's know. sort of reading the context. Yeah. So it, it, that's right. I mean, that's what it's it's trying to do, is it's trying to analyze your text in white, in the white block. And then summer, that's basically at the very top, a summary of the text. So remember when I showed you, write me a summary of this block of text, that's what it's doing here. So mm -hmm. each of these segments over here is a some kind of summary or some kind of analysis of the text in white, right? So one of the things you can do, it's, it's I don't, it, this is just the, the article about it. You can, so these are the things you can do. You can summarize, you can ask questions, you can generate new ideas. So you can ask Notebook LM, give me some new ideas to extend this paper. Um, and so this is all does this, it's all fine, right? So what's this, what you can also do with this though, is um, say, give me some con arguments, right? Devil's so it, it's, it, exactly, exactly right. So I can say, uh, as though I'd say, Joyce, here's an article I wrote, tell me where I'm wrong. So you could ask Notebook LM to do that for you. Mm -hmm. which is kind of nice, right? Because yeah. that will help you find logical errors. I mean, it's going well beyond spell correction and grammar correction and so on. It's it's not doing logical correction, but it's saying, you know, this is an ad hominem attack. It will say things like that. Or it will say, you know, you show this, but you don't show the logical conclusion from that. Now, what's so interesting about this is that it's not doing logical analysis in the way you and I would think about it. It's looking for the probability that it, you've got text of this kind, which is not followed by text of that kind, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're writing, for example, about the history of, of, of women in computing, you might talk about Ada Lovelace. 
but you never talk about Ada, the language, the programming language, which came from, which was named for her, right? And so yeah. that's a, like a missing piece. And that's a little bit of uh, the kind of analysis you can do. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of cool. Um, maybe this is a good time to, to go over to the, um, let's look at the uh, Bard slash uh, lens analysis. So here um, is an image I found. This is not my tattoo, it's just a disclaimer. <laughs> this is somebody, I just found this on the web. Uh, and so this is somebody's tattoo, and I did the classical Google image search for it. And the way lens works, right, is it tries to find what, you know, uh, other things that look like this, and it tries to identify it. And so it will tell you, you know, here are a bunch of, you know, nearly matching other images. Now, people complain to me all the time. Oh, I don't, it doesn't give me the old match, right, the old way it used to work. For that, you click on this button up here, find image source. So if you do that, this now goes back to the way image search used to work. But now you know how to get back to the old, old school. In addition, however, um, image search now also includes images which are frames from videos. So this is a really cool thing because you can now find people tattooing, getting the tattoo of the caffeine molecule on their arm. So that's some sense that's classical Google image search. Well, as updated as of six months ago or whatever, right? You get the idea. But if I go to say Bard, not, not that one, this one, um, I can upload the image using the plus sign here, right? I can upload the file, which is the same image here. And what Bard does is it gives me a summary of what this thing is, right? So, here, it's interesting that it actually says, oh, I know this is a tattoo. It says it's caffeine, it's identified it. And then this is all the usual stuff you get from, from regular Google. So if I uh, did a Google search for caffeine, you get all this stuff here. So that's pretty ordinary. But what's so interesting about it is that it does this little bit here, identifies it as a tattoo, which image search did not. It mm -hmm. also says, this is a simple and elegant representation of the caffeine molecule. Bard doesn't know from elegant. It just doesn't. I'm wondering right? about that. <laughs> <laughs> I but, but it goes back to this thing we were talking about earlier, which is that it's text that's associated that's most probable. So it has learned from seeing a few thousand examples of this that things like this are called elegant, but it doesn't, it literally doesn't know what elegant means, right? Right, right. Uh, so you, you get the idea. Um, so here's another image I had done where I said, what kind of sunset is this? And um, it correctly identified this, not just as a sunset, but as a tropical sunset, which I thought was rather smart. So the way, now you're going to ask me, Dan, how does this work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see palm trees or anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, that? yeah. It's, it's funny because actually, if, if I click on that, I, yeah, I guess you can see it. Uh, um, it's, it's characteristic of this line of clouds and, and a little boat and these big, broad beaches. So, yeah, it actually did a good job. I mean, it's not obvious that that's a tropical photograph, but it got, oops, got it, but it got it right. Not done this yet, so I, I'll be interested to see what comes <laughs> out. Um, uh, yeah, good, cool. It's a garden tulip characterized, blah, blah, blah. Garden tulip, blah, 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 blah. Um, one of the things it could have said here is that this is called a broken tulip, but it didn't, right? So there's a lot, I mean, the, I guess we could look at other drafts here and see what, uh, actually, this, these are all kind of the same thing. This is not, yeah. particularly, not particularly useful, but it is it is showing that the flower is in full bloom, it looks healthy. So the way, the, let me tell you a secret about some of this stuff. Um, the way these responses are being generated is it's not, what you've been told. It's not just the most probable next word. There's um, hidden from you, hidden from the user, is what's called a meta prompt. And, and the meta prompt is what the Google system tells itself as a way to answer a question like this. So the meta prompt would say things like, uh, describe the, the flower in the image, um, comment on whether or not it looks healthy, uh, 
it, then give a, a, a nice summary at the end. So that's where this comes from. This, I hope your answer is your question, right? Because the explanations you've been told about how this stuff works cannot generate that sentence I've highlighted because that's not probable in any case. So but it comes that's it, embedded in a meta prompt that it is yeah. automatically executing. Yes, yes, exactly. So when you type in your prompt here, which in this case is what is this? And I've handed it this picture. What that what Google does is it takes that question, that prompt, and wraps it the, around the meta prompt. So it basically embeds it. So think of a, a big prompt that right goes before the prompt. And that's basically instructions on what to do. So if I said something like, what is this? It will then say, blah, 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 blah. And at the end, give this standard comment. If you look through your interactions with Bard, you'll see often these kinds of things like, I hope this does it. I hope it, you know, whatever. These yeah. kinds of um, you know, social commentary, basically, at the end. Um, why, so, why, why, why do we have that? Because somebody has decided that they're the humans like that. That's it. That's totally it. <laughs> so now, if you were to say, well, wait a minute, isn't this a broken tulip or whatever the variety you oh, we could try guess that. Uh-huh. Oh, I should, I should, I, well, let's see what I happens. prompted too much. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Why this tulip uh, streaked? Hmm. So, um, so what I was, what I was thinking was it was caused by this thing called the tulip breaking virus. And this is the kind of thing I would, if I was actually researching this to write a paper or something, I would want to understand what's going on here because I, as a flower fancier, I would say, I think this is a broken tulip because it's infected by this virus, right? But if you're, say, the ninth grade, you have no idea what a broken tulip is. <laughs> right? Yeah. So right. it, it, it's, it, this is, this will go back to the classic sort of uh, frame of reference of what a really great reference librarian does, which is to provide context and background information. So, All right. so, it, are this, so if I were doing this in Google Lens, I get yeah. the other images, but I've been getting sources from Bard as well. Oh, really? Yeah. Sources like citation sources? Yeah, like you might want to look here. I should have been prepared to bring those things yeah. up. But uh, it, it, well, so here's a quick comment about that, um, which is uh, Google had that experiment on for a while and then they turned it off and I'm in the off condition. So you're clearly in the in condition. Ah. Oh. Right. So do you know about Google search experiments? Do you know yes. about this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're in the in group. I'm in the non in group. I know I joined it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I'm actually surprised that it's still working for you. Okay. It, I, I don't see citations. They, as far as I know, they did that. They started at like mm, middle of last month. And I believe they turned it off for almost everybody. Try the Malcolm Gladwell one. Because that should give citations to Gladwell. Okay. And it's, there's no, I mean, that's, that, that's really asking for citations right there. <clears throat> okay, let me just go here because this is a presentation I've been working on. Okay. Yeah, there's one on the right. Oh, that's Bing. That's that's Bing. Maybe I was wrong all along. Yeah, well, Bing does it. Bing yeah. absolutely does it. Still does it. I just did, did it this morning. All right, I guess I was wrong. <laughs> oh, it's also worth noting that <clears throat> those citations can be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Right. So what are you showing um, us now? This what I'm showing you now is this thing called Chat PDF. Yes. Um, so it's basically a, a way of <clears throat> you import the PDF when you launch it, and then basically does a Chat GPT sort of summary and, and analysis of it. So this is an article I uploaded um, from the Journal of Archaeological Research, and on the left hand side you can see I'm I'm just scrolling through the article, and it's it's kind of long, right? I mean it goes on and on and on. And so what it will do is give you a summary up here at the top. 
and then suggest example questions. And this is sort of the, the way this works, right? I, I can then poke on that, each of those, and see what, you know, um, so for example, um, I can ask a question about this PDF, right? So this is a long, long piece of work. Um, let's say, uh, what is uh, our new findings in paleobotany? So these are now page page numbers, these citations. So this is page 15. Yeah, that's great. Okay. And so you have to know that paleontological actually refers, and that's, you know, what I would do as a student is I'd say to Google to find paleontological. Oh, it's the study of pollen. Got it. Okay. Now it makes sense. Right. So this is the kind of thing where you can actually take a, this is a basically almost like a textbook for recent insights into South American archaeology. And now I can interact with it in a fairly nice way, just with it, right? So I get all of the, all of the power and analytic background of chat GPT, but looking at this one document in particular. And so as a student, this is a very handy study guide or a it's like again like having a colleague that has already read this thing it can point you to particular pieces in it and say oh here's the stuff about paleobotany it's only really page five so now if i click on page five it takes me to page five and highlights the area so this is kind of nice now yeah. this is a classic well not a classic let's say it's a use of chat gpt right and so when chat GP, when they change the version of chat gpt and this goes from 3.5 to 4 you'll get slightly different analysis but it will be less than with the full blown chat gpt 3.5 to 4 gotcha right and right. and also it's worth noting that bard you can figure out what version of bard you're using but you got to dig <clears throat> they don't make it really explicit so bard will shift and you won't be it won't be obvious why it didn't go from Bard twelve to Bard thirteen. They just they just don't tell you, All right? So uh, I I actually like the fact that ChatGPT puts it up on its face and says, "Hey, I'm three point five. So mm -hmm. yeah, Bard yeah. or Claude. So or any Chat PDF is making use of ChatGPT. Yes, yeah, it I'm basically has uploaded the, the full text of the ChatGPT and then has created one of these pre-training uh, layers on top. So now it can tell you on what page particular pieces of, uh, of So does it about. now live in their in their corpus of knowledge? Uh that is an excellent question. Um I I predict that it was already there. I don't actually know that. So this this may not be open science research. This might be uh, you know in uh, one of those big five journal vendor correct, type things. Correct. And, it, and it, so it, it, absolutely it, correct. It's uh, as you can actually, as you can see, this is actually the author's personal copy. I got it from the author himself. So it is, may your, not... is your use of it fair in uploading it and sharing it as part of the training data? So I don't believe this is going into the training data. Uh -huh. it, I should check that. It's an interesting question. If the use of a tool might cause me to commit an a, a misdemeanor yeah All that's right. like uh, why we why the web turned black a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> i mean it, it's an interesting interesting hard question um uh i guess i should find that out figure it out but um my belief at the moment is that this does not contribute to the training corpus mm -hmm. okay right. yeah yeah but I, there are write that down. very compelling use cases for these yeah. That's right. That's right. And so, so there's all these kinds of things going on. Um, so here's another version of the summarized thing. Um, so I, this is now uh, the chat GPT four. Uh, I said summarize Moby Dick in a thousand words, and it does a pretty decent job. But mm -hmm. you know how many summaries of Moby Dick there are. <laughs> so yeah. this is going to be pretty high quality, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I also want to point this out. Um, so. Uh, you probably have this in your slides, but one of the things that's happened, a big change that happened to BARD recently was that they extended it to multiple languages. 
And it's interesting because I know that Bard was originally trained on lots and lots of different languages, many, many different language corpora. And uh, only recently, though, did they turn on the generate other languages. So here I asked, tell me about the politics in Panama in Spanish. And, you know, it's not bad. So here's the translation of that. So I just copy paste it, as you can see. Now, what's interesting is that Oh, sorry. Let me sorry. That's the wrong translation. Here's the right translation. Um, so the one thing that's interesting about this translation from from Bard here, when I asked in English, okay, asked in English, that trans this actually talks about the corruption in the government. If I do this and I ask in Spanish the same question, tell me about the politics of Panama, it gives me a different answer. Huh. Right, which, and it doesn't is. talk about corruption at all. So I don't know if that's because the training corpus in Spanish, when when prompted by a Spanish query, gives me a different kind of results and just avoid the discussion of corruption. Or, and I honestly don't know this, I don't know if this is being translated from Spanish, in, from English into Spanish. It's generating English and then creating Spanish. I, I bet that's what it's doing. And I bet a lot of English sources talk about corruption in Panama. That's so fascinating. The, the, the big point here is that if you ask slightly different questions, maybe even in different languages, you can get very different answers, right? Very different responses. It's a little bit like, um, I think we talked about this last time, about looking at different languages in Wikipedia. Yeah. So for example, right. if you look at the article about cats in English, you get this very nice, warm, fuzzy feeling about cats and there are calico cats and they're all lovely. But if you look at the Spanish language Wikipedia article about cats, it goes in great depth about cat diseases and how you know cat cancers are scourged around the species. And it's like well, it's isn't it the difference? You're searching in the language version, you're searching within the with yeah. writers of the language rather than getting the English yeah. content and translating it right. into right, right, right. But 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 you but no, I think that's correct. But let me change your language just slightly. You said I'm searching within the language, and I don't think you're searching. You have prompted within a language. Right, group. right. Thank you for and that. So the generation, yeah, right. It's a subtle difference, but it we have to keep our language straight so people understand what's different. Yeah, is. you're right. So, what percentage of the training content was native Spanish language? Um, I we could look that up. I don't know off the top of my head, I mean, is um, it, but there's a lot. Is there there's there a is lot. a lot. Okay. And there's a oh, lot yeah. in many languages then. Yeah. 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 In fact, um, I think Sundar Pichai misspoke um, when he did that 60 Minutes interview. Um, he said that one of the things that he, this is what he said in the interview was that um, Bard has an emergent property. And the emergent property he would claimed was that it knew how to speak an Indic language. And I forgot which one, but some low low population Indic language. And he, his claim was, wow, this is amazing. This emerged from the corpus. It wasn't specifically trained. And the problem with that claim is it actually was trained on that language. <laughs> so it wasn't emergent. Now, that's not to say that emergent properties will not happen. But, you know, it, it, so this is actually a big discussion topic in the field. Is artificial general intelligence, what we call AGI, actually happening and so there's a really interesting article from people at, at microsoft about whether or not they see sparks the, the article is sparks of intelligence so you can go search for that mm -hmm. um and they claim that the sparks of intelligence are actually happening um and i'm not sure i completely buy their argument but there is interesting behavior when you get the language corpus up that large Mm -hmm. but it's not it, it doesn't magically learn you know gujarati or something it just doesn't magically know that come on uh, that's a, that's too much of a lift uh, but to your your other point of uh, lower frequency languages uh say egyptian arabic or you know languages with smaller populations like haitian creole i don't know i don't know what's going to do uh, because they're just not that many absolutely in absolute numbers there are absolutely not very many 
web documents in uh, in Haitian Creole or something like Icelandic. So the, does the training effect happen when you've got you know only a million documents versus twenty million documents? That's a that's a question we have yet to answer. So it's fascinating to see where we will be going in this monthly language world, yeah. with respect to large language models. Okay, so <laughs> I want to from my students. Yes. What should should their search habits shift right now because of what's going on relating to generative AI, or are there classic? The classic training that we do in the first couple of months where we really learn about how databases work, um, how to search fields, how yeah. to uh, use fields and facets and and stuff in proprietary databases, as well as the search tools that we've been used to using for the last, what, 15 years? Yeah. Um, what? And I know when I search, when I go into Bing now, Bing chat appears. Yep. And, when, right. and Bard... Bard comes into my Google search. So it's it's hard to ignore it. And so it is. what do we yeah. do as people who are training as professional searchers? Yeah. What's your best advice? <laughs> um, well, let me let me give you an example. <laughs> That's probably the best way to do this. Okay. So here's um here's a question I asked both Bard and ChatGPT. Which would be a better insulator? A pound cake or a pound of science? Oh, what an That's interesting question. <laughs> It's purposefully crazy, right? Okay. Um, uh, but that doesn't stop Bard from giving me a very long exegesis about this topic. It's stupid. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but you see my point, right? Um, and ChatGPT, uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, it does a much better job, right? Actually, so uh, it actually understands that the qu question you asked doesn't make much sense. So what I don't know, I don't know how ChatGPT understood that. I really don't. So I suspect it has to do with the metaprogramming thing we were talking about earlier. Well, I would imagine the phrase pound of science is not something that has been used all that much. And that you might be the first person to use it. Oh, it's very possible. Very possible. Um, but, you know, um, I, I have examples of ChatGPT answering stupid questions as well. So it's not universal. I think as as teachers of this this kinds of skills, one of the things we have to recognize is that um, you still have to know how to ask a good question. You still have to know that because question formulation and question framing is is a I think a fundamental skill mm -hmm. because uh, I, the other question you could ask is which weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? <laughs> it's the same, <laughs> of right? Course. But 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 you know people i mean people have their own issues with with questions like that I, i've got a bunch there are a bunch of standard cognitive science questions where people will always answer incorrectly because they get misled by the, the suppositions they're baking in the question so um i think what we're doing is entering into a new phase of teaching people how to search where we now have this sort of almost agent-like capability in bard or chat gpt in these large language models to ask questions and have a conversation and we have to learn how to how to be discerning how to actually have some intelligence about not just accepting the answer straight off the straight off the screen right so you I, I still think we have to teach discernment i also think going back to your your previous question there are information sources that are not indexed or are not scanned by large language models and you know so, for example, not far from here, there's a really lovely archive up in Martinez, California. And Martinez, as you probably know, was the first capital of California. So they actually have this really interesting archive that has all kinds of stuff. Zero of it is online. Zero. So archival skills will be persistent, right? They're not going to go away. Um, and as you as you well know, the Library of Congress has tons of stuff that they have. They will digitize it in probably the year 3000. Uh, in the meantime, if you want to do your research, you got to go there. So, yeah. so these fundamental skills, you know, what does it mean to index? What does it mean to great uh, uh, reasonable search terms? What is a cataloging structure? Those are all things that are going to be useful going forward. But we will also have these 
large language models that can act as agents to sort of help us understand the framing of our questions and reflect on ways that we might not have thought about. And I also think the, the thing we haven't talked about, but is super interesting, I think, for people who work in data science is the, the ability of these things to write code. And so there's, that's a whole nother discussion. But I had this example the other day where um, I, I finally asked ChatGPT4 um, with the code extension to write a little piece of Python for me to do some data transformation about this long list of things I was interested in. And, and it gave me the Python code. I ran it. It was great. No problem. Yay, yay. Yay for data science. But then I thought, wait a second. What if I asked ChatGPT just to change the data without writing any code? And I'll be damned. If damn, it worked. It totally worked. <laughs> I I was impressed because what I was doing was at <clears throat> taking this long list of of uh, uh, responses in a survey, and I said I want to know the countries from which everybody came from, and the only information I had was their email addresses, and so. When I asked it to do that kind of analysis, it totally did it. Zero wow. code. So zero code is better than, you know, 20 lines of Python. Uh, and so I realized it could, I could have spent an hour writing that code, debugging it. Or I could have spent five minutes, which I did, asking ChatGP to write me that data transformation code. Or I could spend 20 seconds and have it do it directly on the data. That's interesting, right? Yeah, I mean, it there's really... so many amazing, like I... A religion professor wrote me the other day and said, how might I use this with some of my assignments? And I said, well, I mean, one of the exciting things would be to like be able to go through lots and lots of text and tell me if I'm off on this, but it worked. Um, so I said, why don't you ask a question like, what does the afterlife look like according to the major religious texts across mm -hmm. the centuries and across the faiths? Right, right. And give me the where they are in the text so oh that sounds great it was great, great. it was yeah. so it was yeah. so wonderful and then you could have the students go deeply into that and yeah. analyze the differences and you could also say please put this in table form and here are right. the categories exactly. i'd like exactly. to see yeah and my, my imagine the time saved um and the ability to get into some deep analysis now that that finding part uh, the discovery part of that has been simplified Correct. I think that's actually a brilliant move. Um, so you can uh, you can basically skip through the part that's laborious, right? Like <laughs> my personal bug is, you know, people have wasted eons fixing up bibliographic citations. And I know they're important, but man, I hate chasing periods and semicolons and commas. Oh, that should be automated. <laughs> that's exactly right. Exactly. So that's the extent that we can automate that stuff, right? Um, uh, but by the same token, you still have to have a sense of, of reasonableness about a lot of these things because uh, we've seen it in Google Books, for example, we get metadata from lots of libraries. And I will tell you, a lot of that metadata is wrong and it's wrong in sort of fundamental ways, like just internal consistency. There's no way this can be true. Right? Mm -hmm. You can't have an author who died in 1926, but the publication date was 1812. Right? It just doesn't happen. Um, uh, unless they're extraordinarily long, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, the validation like that, or like the transformation, the, the sort of query you just mentioned, I think is a really great application. Um, well, one of my favorite stories about this was a, a linguistics professor at Berkeley who asked ChatGPT for a few examples of a particular linguistics phenomena called framing. He said, ChatGPT, right, tell me about framing, blah, 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 blah. It writes a very nice paragraph. He gave that to his students and said, okay, students, find three errors in this write-up. Oh, right? cool. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't ask Chat GPT about it because it just wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was a very clever move. It's kind of a judo move, right? How, how to turn the force back onto itself. Uh, so that was nice. And I like your example of the religion studies. So I think there's a lot of stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and in particular, one thing that um, comes up a lot in uh, in library work is things like, how do I search cross domains? So I want to search, for example, in medicine yeah. and in uh, metallic chemistry for 
factors that influence migraines, right? Um, and you can ask that question, but they use, they're disjoint. They don't use the same I have. This, let me tell you what I did. Yeah. This whole notion of interdisciplinarity yeah. is is hard because we get stuck in the thesauri for our fields mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the authors and the journals yeah. of our field. So I was looking, I, I think it was, I get the example I gave was ADHD. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted, I forget what the prompt was. Oh yes, I know what the prompt was. So I said, please go across the Eric thesaurus, the psych info thesaurus, and um um oh gosh mesh the mesh thesaurus right and give me the the major subject headings to describe adhd mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and wow all of a sudden i was able to see how language language was differently used across the fields right. to right. describe the same condition that's and great so, that's a brilliant brilliant yeah. Yeah. oh thanks yeah. i love it <laughs> i've yeah. been playing around a lot yeah. Uh, but it was it was really an, uh, an alert because you could see what you were missing going into a huge discovery search and simply using words that meant something to some people and not others. And then, boom, right. you use the words. Right. Yeah. So, well, I love that. I love that example. Uh, I would love to do something similar for um, uh, uh, the missing knowledge. What's the things you don't know that you don't know? And yeah. so that's kind of a way to get at that. Yeah, yeah. So, wow. All right, Dan, we have been on for a long time. Oh, Words wow. of advice. We Just, have. <laughs> can you give advice to um, pre-service librarians in terms of what they should be open to moving forward? Um, yeah, sure. A couple of things. Um, uh, large language models are your friend, but uh, verify everything they say. <laughs> don't, don't trust anything. Uh, so, as we mentioned very early on, I think one of the real advantages is um, the ability to get different perspectives on a topic or to get, you know, for example, key search terms that you wouldn't have thought about. This has happened to be a lot. Maybe it happened to you. So that's Absolutely. another thing. Um, yeah. And an, another thing to be aware of is that they will change. Uh, and you sort of have to stay on top of this because you can't expect that the training corpus will stay constant over the next, say, 10 years. Um, and so if, for example, the copyright thing gets adjudicated one way versus another way, what you might end up with, this is a prediction, is uh, you might end up with one version of a large language model running in the US and another one in Europe and another one in Australia and another one in Tanzania. And they're going to be different because copyright is different from country to country to country. And it, one of the side effects of this is um, some countries who have less sort of regard for international norms and copyright, right, they might very well end up having the most powerful and most useful language model. That's unfortunate, but I think it's true. At any rate. All right. Well, thank you, Dan Russell. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so it's been a pleasure. pleasure.